Okay, thank you, Asher. It's my disclosure. And I'll start off with two case discussions, and that will provide a context for additional discussion and the videos as we go along. And this first patient was seen by several colleagues at Penn, presented at a Grand Rounds by Carolyn Newberry, one of our fellows last year, who's now at New York Hospital Cornell. So this is a 28-year-old woman with chronic iron deficiency anemia and abdominal pain who underwent a small bowel resection at age 13 for management of Crohn's disease. Post-op in 2002, she's briefly on 6-MP and Pentassa and stopped these in favor of holistic care. Next followed up in 2015 when she's noted to be profoundly anemic during pregnancy, recommended to follow up in GI clinic after delivery. She underwent an EGD and colonoscopy at an outside hospital in September of 2017 without evidence of active disease. She's then seen uh, at that same outside hospital, underwent um, uh, at that point um, and underwent an enterography, an MR enterography. We, we do not have those films, which showed some dilatation in the proximal ileum downstream from an area of narrowing. Um, she was then seen by our Penn colleagues, and at that point, the consideration was for a capsule endoscopy following a negative patency. So she did undergo a patency capsule, which was cleared in September 2017, followed by a video capsule endoscopy study. And that study showed an ulcerated area with apparent narrowing seen in the distal small bowel. Um, videos are on the next two slides. The capsule was not seen to enter the colon by the end of that study. Her abdominal x an abdominal x-ray was therefore recommended, which was done several weeks later, as we'll see um, shortly. If you can please start the video. So basically, you start seeing this ulcerated area um, where the capsule does not really seem to pass. You watch it for. I have 30 seconds here, but this basically seemed to be the case for several minutes um, at a minimum. And we'll go to the next slide. And if you can please start that video. And three hours later, it looks like we're at the same lesion um, somewhere in the small bell. Going forward several weeks later, so the capsule study was October 10th. And several weeks later, she underwent abdominal x-ray. Two weeks later, um, there was a capsule in the left upper quadrant. And then several weeks after that, in early November, capsule seemed to be in roughly the same area. So at that juncture, uh, the recommendation was for a device-assisted um, enteroscopy uh, performed by one of our colleagues, Dr. Fisher, which showed a Let's see if this, uh, the mouse does not work as a pointer, I guess, but that showed a uh, small bowel stricture in the distal um, small intestine and it's outlined here. And at that point, the capsule was not seen, not retrieved. Several weeks later, at our institution, she underwent an MR enterography, which demonstrated actually CT of the abdomen and pelvis. Uh, this was actually late January of this year, which showed multiple segmental areas of narrowing associated with mucosal edema beginning in the mid-small bowel. Um, two areas of tight narrowing were seen in the left lower quadrant, and uh, they were located in the small intestine with proximal small bowel dilatation. She underwent um, repeat x-ray on January 11th, which still showed the video capsule that I had mentioned. Um, we recommended her for surgical evaluation. Um, interestingly, she passed the video capsule on January uh, 18th. She happened to notice this passage, underwent laparoscopic small bowel resection uh, of a small bowel stricture site on February 5th. She did well post-op, initially elected to treat Crohn's with a strict elemental diet, but eventually agreed to start a biologic agent. And she remains asymptomatic um, as of last month on adalimumab. Um, case two is a patient of mine who's a 20-year-old woman who we saw initially early in 2017 for ongoing GI symptoms, intermittent right lower quadrant abdominal pain and chronic diarrhea since 2014, and recent 20-pound weight loss over the past two months 
in early 2017. She underwent a small bowel follow-through, uh, which we'll show in a slide after next, as well as a colonoscopy shortly after her clinic visit with us. The small bowel follow-through showed multiple segments of narrowing um, and cobblestoning in the terminal ileum. And then I performed a colonoscopy February 27th, which showed I could only intubate the TI to about five centimeters, but could not examine beyond this point because of edema and luminal narrowing. There was segmental moderate to severe ulceration, edema, and nodularity. And I showed the path specifically because on, on the um, right-hand side, there's actually evidence of a non-necrotizing granuloma, which, which was a nice photo. Um, and I encircled that area, um, which you can see nicely there. So she had a diagnosis of Crohn's. Um, also, she underwent several iron transfusions, transfusions around that time for severe iron deficiency anemia. Uh, we had extensive discussion with the patient and her parents, and she's initially reluctant to consider any biologic because of risk concerns. Um, she and her mom and dad have extensive statistical background, and they did their own meta-analysis on the available literature, and she opted to go with uh, veto based on uh, that analysis. And um, her abdominal pain and diarrhea improved by May 2017. Didn't really hear much from her. She underwent a colonoscopy in September of that year. The TI was now intubated to 25 centimeters with mild pa patchy edema, some erythema, and scarring, but less nodularity, less luminal narrowing. And overall, I felt that the mucosal disease was compared to her biologic start in February 2017. We then did not hear from her for several months. She came in for an urgent office visit on January 30th of this year, complaining of three days of kind of generalized abdominal pain, abdominal bloating, and, mod and uh, with moderate distension of her abdomen and physical. And then we did this MRE, which showed small bowel obstruction, likely due to a high-grade stricture of the distal ileum, um, and there was also some degree of mild inflammatory disease activity. Uh, and for the distal ileal obstruction, she underwent a laparoscopic ileocecal resection February 13th of this year. She re resumed veto. She now agreed to dose intensify to uh, every six weeks per further discussion and their statistical analysis. And, you know, we came up w with that plan. She then did well until late April of 2018 when she called saying she had recurrent postprandial bloating and other symptoms of recurrent SBO. And here's her MR from that study, which uh, showed uh, her post ileocecectomy status, um, as well as a small bowel obstruction with a transition point in the distal ileum somewhere near uh, the anastomosis, but the radiologist was not certain. She underwent repeat ileocolic resection at that point, just approximately uh, three months or less later um, after her initial resection for rapid occurrence of perianastomotic, now had a five centimeter long fibrostenotic stricture um, on May 10th resume meet veto again after that, after further discussion. We shorten the interval to um, every four weeks, and she's still continuing to consider possibly other biologics, you know, given her rapid disease recurrence, which appeared to be primarily fibrosynodic, but perhaps drive um, you know, a decreased chance of recurrence through decreasing inflammation. Um, in the ensuing slides, they have some photos and videos um, showing her follow-up colonoscopy um, several months post-op. So basically, I did a colonoscopy um, in August of that year showing an ileocolic anastomotic stricture. She's asymptomatic at this point. And then I was able to gently dilate and move beyond with a TTS dilator. And I have some videos of that. If you can please start the videos. Uh, thank you. So this is a TTS balloon dilator. And I dilated her to about 13.5 centimeters. And I will say, I think one of the teaching points here, which I'll reinforce later, is that I felt very comfortable doing this. I could see easily through that it was a short stricture. My heart rate did not go up. I didn't become diaphoretic contemplating uh, dilating this. And um, I didn't think I needed to defer to an advanced endoscopist um, for this particular stricture. And usually, we'll hold the balloon in place for approximately um, uh, a minute or so, though there's not really much evidence. I think that's just a convention. And if you can start this video, please. 
Thank you. This is uh, post dilation, her small bowel. Um, I will irrigate it, and ultimately, I term this a root gear uh, I1 score. She had some mild diffuse edema and occasional uh, mild small erosions, uh, which you'll see toward the end of the irrigation process. That's just uh, some mucus and exudate. You can start to see a few small erosions and such on this particular video. Okay, if you can, now on, on these videos, um, this is a patient who has a complex, somewhat angulated, multiple colonic strictures, and Greg Ginsberg, one of our advanced endoscopists, kindly provided me with these videos. This is a patient of a colleague of mine. It's a colonic stricture, but I wanted to show the types of strictures that most of us will refer to an advanced endoscopist. So he's using a guide wire or glide wire under fluoroscopy because of the somewhat angulated nature and also because of the strength of this particular stricture, uh, the length of the stricture. And he's using the guide wire to work it a little around. Um, it's not very angulated. Those, you, as you'll see, often will require surgery, such as splenic flexure strictures and the like. And if you can please start this video as well. It's a shorter video. Um, Greg deflates a balloon. Next, uh, go to the next slide. And please start this video as well. Greg ballooned it a little bit more. He was not quite satisfied or could not get through the area of stricturing or stenosis. And I'll move forward after that. You can actually see that he was able to get through um, shortly without, with, with minimal difficulty. And now he's in colon beyond that area. And just to review some basics regarding um, capsule endoscopy, there are two validated uh, scoring systems for capsule endoscopy, the CECDAI and uh, the Lewis scoring system, both of which are used for clinical and also research purposes, and combine a combination of inflammatory findings, ulceration, stricturing, including length of stricturing or length of disease. Um, just to review basic findings that we can see on capsule endoscopy include anywhere from aphthe to ulcers, larger ulcers, deep ulcers, and such. And in terms of suspected and known Crohn's disease, Dionisio and colleagues about eight years ago did two meta-analyses looking at patients uh, with suspected Crohn's and patients with known Crohn's in terms of the yield of capsule endoscopy compared to various other modalities, um, including small bowel follow-through, small bowel enterocolysis, which they lame, uh, uh, label small bowel radiology, and CTE. And in terms of both groups actually found that the capsule had higher yield compared to all modalities uh, that I had mentioned except for MR enterography. Um, in terms of the utility of capsule endoscopy in small bowel Crohn's, um, there is isolated small bowel disease in 30% of patients, so it is a helpful modality in selected patients. Uh, it's become an important part of our diagnosis and management of Crohn's, and it continues to evolve because of tech advances. Uh, Cross-sectional imaging also evolves in parallel with this, so you need to weigh the pros and cons and you know, likelihood of it changing our management and giving us some guidance. It does offer a high diagnostic yield in patients with suspected Crohn's, though has low positive predictive value and modest specificity. And highlighted by our first case, should only be performed in patients without obstructive symptoms or known stenosis. In these patients, I often will not even consider a patency and will use other modalities, which could include um, deep device-assisted um, enteroscopy, anterograde or retrograde, depending upon where you think the lesions are most likely to be. And that's obviously to decrease your risk of capsule retention. And DAE and CT and MRE continue to evolve as well. I'm looking, um, these, uh, this study was done actually very recently, just published several months ago. Um, Sorrentino and colleagues in Italy reviewed consecutive Crohn's patients with a negative ileo colonoscopy but unexplained symptoms, compared colonoscopy, various imaging, MRE, CTE, and fecal lactoferrin to small bowel video capsule, both in patients who were surgery naive and patients who had undergone surgery. And 
from their study, the take-home message is it can change the management, especially in the post-op patients, um, in, uh, up to 52% of patients, and did quite well compared to the other modalities. So it can support the diagnosis of Crohn's in the small intestine when colonoscopy, imaging, and or inflammatory markers are negative. And we should remember that um, on ileocolonoscopy, we're only seeing you know, in a very small portion of, of ileum looking in a TI. This study I found very interesting. Uh, this was published also earlier this year, just several months ago, and it was a prospective. Uh, it's actually very interesting. The authors compared two cohorts. There was an older retrospective video capsule co cohort from 2001 to 2008, then a prospective cohort from 2008 to 2011, I was most interested in the retention rate. The retention rate in these two cohorts over time, albeit not, you know, not done the same way, um, was actually significantly lower in the more recent uh, cohort ending in 2011. And possible explanations are there's a learning curve, you know, there has been a learning curve over the past 15 years for small bowel capsule studies, and uh, the patency capsule may have decreased this, again, not in every case. Um, and dedicated cross-sectional imaging has been, you know, a helpful adjunct um, in terms of having us avoid, you know, certain uh, capsules in certain patients. And then um, these authors actually nicely compiled the table from the available evidence um, in terms of considering endoscopic dilatation, safe versus less safe. And basically here, intuition comports with the current evidence. Um, you know, basically shorter, simpler strictures like in my first patient tend to do better. Intermediate strictures by the second should at least have the involvement of an advanced endoscopist in most cases. And then um, thirdly, um, you know, if you can see through, it's very straight, shorter length. It, uh, those patients tend to have, you know, better outcomes and safer outcomes. And then intuitively, you would think if there's significant inflammation surrounding the stricture, um, if it's caused by extrinsic compression, if it's near a fistula, these patients tend to do less well. Also longer, greater than five centimeter and sharply angulated strictures do not do well. And uh, although not nearly as elegant as Dr. Columbell's um, slides, this, um, study actually relatively recently was a retrospective review of adults hospitalized for small bowel Crohn's looking, uh, used a multivariate modeling uh, to demonstrate that in their case, small bowel dilation greater than 35 millimeters on various imaging modalities and a platelet to albumin ratio greater than or equal to 125 predicted the need for intestinal resection in their group uh, for, uh, within two years of initial presentation. And uh, so this can be considered to guide medical versus surgical management decisions and inform some of our discussions uh, with patients and family. And just some of the take-home points, Crohn's in a small bowel can be assessed by imaging, capsule endo, and deep entero. Capsule retention can occur in patients, particularly in the setting of obstructing disease. Patiency capsules can be helpful in determining the safety, but do not guarantee VCE passage, and patients should definitely be counseled on that risk always, and a standardized scoring system exists for assessing disease activity, um, the Lewis and uh, CDAI, CECDAI scores that I showed, and they take into account the presence of mucosal disease as well as disease location and extent. And in comparative studies, video capsule has done well in terms of diagnostic yield compared to imaging and uh, endoscopic modalities and uh, can certainly support the diagnosis of small bowel Crohn's when other um, studies and inflammatory markers are negative. In terms of endoscopic stricture dilation, intuitively you can weigh the predictors of successful dilation versus risk factors for complication based on uh, one of the latest, later slides that I'd shown. Fibrotic, short, less than five uh, centimeter strictures tend to do better and increased risk of complications with longer inflammatory strictures in those that are angulated. And it should really be a multidisciplinary approach beyond the simple, straight, short stricture that you can see through. And we always involved our experienced advanced endoscopists and surgeons to plan the safest, most effective approach. And you should consider direct referral to a surgeon in patients with the highest risk factors for complications with endoscopic dilation, perhaps bypassing your advanced endoscopist. Thank you.